Uh, you've written a piece Thank for you. Project Syndicate in which you talk about the disconnect between a really robust stock market on the one hand and some real challenges politically. Why is there this disconnect? The stock market is doing so well, politics maybe not so much. Well, I, I have trouble reconciling it. The only thing I can dis, uh, think about in, in the article is that neither of them are going to regulate AI, and AI is behind a lot of the boom in the stock market. And they figure, well, it's going to be like social media. It's going to be like big tech. It's going to be like Bitcoin. In the end of the day, they're going to do nothing, and the stock market rolls along. Well, talking about things that they might share in common in terms of policy, they also, perhaps, as you suggested in the piece, may share sort of a, uh, sort of a tendency toward protectionism, if I can call it that, sort of a populist approach on tariffs, uh, as well as a reluctance to deal with the debt and the deficit. Well, absolutely. So. Uh, obviously, Trump put in the, his tariffs, and Biden has essentially doubled down on it. Legal immigration is still really hard uh, under Biden. You know, became much harder under Trump. I, I won't speak of the open border policies, but uh, they both, you know, in that respect, were trying to shut out the outside world. And uh, Trump's talking about expanding his tariffs. And Biden's uh, Inflation Reduction Act, kind of misnamed, is very protectionist. I mean, the Europeans are livid about it. Uh, he, he does things that where you have to buy American in many ways. So we, they're certainly the two most protectionist presidents in a long time. How much and, of oh, I'm sorry, you asked about the debt. He, and yes, I mean, Washington in general uh, has a very... Uh, relaxed attitude towards debt that I think they're going to be sorry about. Uh, Biden's speech suggested blowing up the debt. And, uh, of course, we have really no idea what Donald Trump will do. But that's what he did last time he was president. A good guess he will do it again. And as you know, David, you can't count on real interest rates being ultra low anymore. I think they're probably not going to be. And the idea that it's a free lunch, I think, is uh, past thinking. Yeah, I want to come back to the real interest rates, but before that, let's go, let's talk about tariffs for just for a second, because President Trump has said he wants 10 percent tariffs across the board for all countries worldwide. And, and by the way, he might increase them if anybody reciprocated with tariffs coming back. And against China, he's talking about 50 or even 60 percent tariffs. What likely effect could that have on the economy? We, I must say, we did have Paul Krugman on who said 10 percent tariffs don't make that much of a difference. I, I mean, 10 percent tariffs uh, would, I think, uh, push up. Uh, inflation, they push up interest rates. The, uh, that, that certainly, back when Trump put in his uh, tariffs in uh, 2019, the Fed had to do an about face on its interest rate policy because of the, the uncertainty and stress that caused. So, you know, it's, it's one thing to talk about over a 50-year horizon, does it matter that much if you put in tariffs? If you do it out of the blue, it's very dislocating to the economy. Uh, I think it would be very, tend to be very recessionary, inflationary, uh, and, uh, and obviously other countries would retaliate. So let's come back to that question you raised about the long-term real interest rates, uh, because there is something of a disagreement, it appears. We had Mary Daly on from the San Francisco Fed recently, who said she still thinks it's around 2.5 to 3 percent sort of a long-term neutral rate, which is composed of various components, as you know so well. Uh, on the other hand, Larry Summers has come on and said it's much higher than that. You, in the past, have said you think it is higher. No. I, well, I, I've studied the most the 10-year rate, uh, really long-term data on 10-year rates. And, uh, it, you know, it's not, it, it's probably more in the range of one and a half to two percent than in the zero percent that it was from 2012 to 2021. The short term rate, uh, I, I don't, you know, it's possible the term premiums change. But, you know, look at the economy. It, it doesn't feel like we have really tight monetary policy. If, if we were really three percent above a neutral rate right now, you would think that something would have hit faster and harder. And I, I would agree with my colleague Larry Summers that, you know, we're probably more like a percent or a percent and a half above what would currently be a neutral rate. So if you're aiming for 2.5, I think you're going to end up stopping a long time before you get there. So bring this back to the question of whether it is a President Biden or President Trump come next year. 
Uh, either one of them is going to have to deal with the consequences of that. Take us through what some of the possible consequences are, because the assumptions put into the budget, for example, are much more modest when it comes to interest. So, so there are two ways it can go. Um, it could end up in inflation, which happened last time, which would eventually ratchet up interest rates. I think one of the reasons inflation is a little stuck at a high level is partly because if you've just experienced this inflation burst, things don't calm down right away. But so one possibility is there's inflation and then we ratchet up to higher and higher interest rates. But I think uh, if the Fed were to stick to its guns and not allow that, then you're really not seeing interest rates come down. Uh, I think we're in an environment where there's so many demands on the government, uh, even if the neither candidate quite realizes that defense spending is going to have to go up. I think it went quite a bit down in Biden's uh, budget proposal and Trump presumably retreating out of NATO plans the same. I don't think so. Uh, green transition is going to cost something. Populism and global debt's really high. There are a lot of upward pressures. And this environment where you can just jack up the U.S. debt and assume there'll effect effectively be no effect you'll even see the interest rates drop. I think that was a post-financial crisis thing, and it's not a post-pandemic thing. What does that mean for fiscal policy going forward? Whatever President Trump or President Biden wants to do going in, what constraints may they have on fiscal policy, given what you just said? Well, you take bigger and bigger risks as you blow up the debt. I mean, you can just keep borrowing all the money you need to pay the interest and keep expanding the debt. The CBO estimates bounce all over the place, but most recently they projected the debt GDP ratio getting to uh, 170 percent in the year 2053. Uh, but, uh, you know, that really leaves a lot of room for accidents. So, yeah, I mean, we don't know what an upper limit is. There is no upper limit. But as you get higher and higher, it puts political pressures on the Fed. It puts volatility to inflation and interest rates. We will feel events that create pressures, that it's just not the free lunch. Ken, how do you assess the prospect? We don't know, but the prospect, at least, the productivity and growth will save us. I mean, we have seen something of a productivity upsurge in just in recent months here. We don't know exactly what it is, perhaps more immigration, actually, uh, whether it's lawful or otherwise, and also some other sor source of productivity. Could we grow ourselves out of this problem? I mean, first of all, in the immigration, immigration is good, but a rational immigration problem yeah, a rational immigration policy would be better. I mean, if, if you tell me, let's spend $10 trillion, you can probably get some growth out of that. The U.S. has room to have immigration. You will get some at least, you know, temporary boost uh, perhaps out of that. But it's much less than it could be. You're giving up an asset by not having a rational immigration policy. Um, AI, I'm, I'm a big believer in AI, but the question is, you know, is what we're seeing in the stock market a belief that firms are going to get a bigger share because they're going to be laying people off and it'll be, you know, globalization squared? There's certainly a lot of studies and reports showing that. Is it really going to be just much higher growth in the economy? I mean, it's sort of hard. So are firms getting a bigger piece of the pie or is the pie growing faster? And I, I think the, the firms getting a bigger piece of the pie is um, a very big part of what's going on. Ken, as you look back through history, how much can economic growth be helped just by a steady hand at the wheel? I mean, we tend to go back and forth right now. It seems like every four years we're veering between what on their face look like very different sorts of policies. To what extent can you get some growth just by staying in this given direction, whatever direction that is? Well, I think one of the ways the U.S. has worked so well, for better or for worse, I mean, we have a lot of problems, is they haven't done that much over the last 20 or 25 years. I mean, they make big policy announcements. We obviously had a lot of pandemic stimulus. But precisely because the country is so divided and there are very few periods where the president, House and Senate are all of the same party, there's a sense in which the steady hand's been yielded by voters of mm -hmm. not giving anyone too much power. But the trouble with that is, is stuff changes. We, we ought to be regulating AI. I think this is just a historic mistake. It was terrible not to regulate social media mental health, political problems. 
AI is social media times 10, times 100. And so I think it's very, very worrisome that they don't seem to be moving on that. But uh, yeah, of course, a steady hand is worth a lot. The, the fact that inflation's low and, and constant's been incredibly helpful to productivity, having predictable tax policies helpful. Uh, so of course, it's quite helpful. But um, it, 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 if, if there are big majorities going back and forth, it's not just the president changing hands, but the, the House changing hands, but you really see these more wholesale shifts in power, then policies can be very erratic. We have such extremes in economic policy at the moment.